welcome. I'm Michelle Merchant Johnson with Love Life Coaching, and I'm delighted to be with you here today with a lovely guest, Dr. Margaret Paul. Welcome, Margaret. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to this time with you. I'm so thrilled and honored to have the opportunity to introduce you to the audience. Some may be familiar with your work, but I'm sure we have new people to introduce to you as well. And you're someone whose work I've admired for some time. So I'm really thrilled to have the opportunity to share your wisdom to this audience today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. And so we are going to be talking about some things that I think are really important and really helpful to those of you who desire to have a loving, committed partnership relationship in your life which is the vast majority of this audience. So stay tuned, but just wanted to mention a couple of things real quick before I introduce Margaret and get underway. And that is that we have some special time sensitive links for some complimentary gifts coming from Margaret. And we want you to be sure to check those out. In case you don't listen to the end, we wanted to mention that now and also if you haven't already subscribed to the channel or you find this video helpful, please subscribe and give the video a thumbs up or make a comment below because that helps support me and the work of my guests. So thank you so much for that. So with that, Margaret, I just want to jump in and give a short uh, official introduction and then I can't wait to hear what you have to share with us today. Dr. Margaret Paul is a best-selling author, relationship expert, and co-creator of the powerful inner bonding self-healing process. Recommended by authors Marcy, Marcy Shimoff, Dr. Sue Mortar, and singer Alanis Morissette. She has appeared on numerous radio and television shows, including Oprah. Her book titles include Do I Have to Give Up on Me? Give Up Me to Be Loved by you, healing you, uh, I'm sorry, cut off, Margaret, healing you, bonding. Yeah, yeah healing your aloneness. Your, healing your aloneness, inner bonding, and the recently released Diet for D Divine Connection and Inner Bonding Workbook. That's a lot of works. That's a lot, a big body of work. And Margaret has successfully worked with thousands of people around the world with her work and has been doing this for a number of years and has helped so many people. So again, welcome, Margaret. I'm so happy to have you here. Thank you very much. Actually, I've been doing this for over 50 years. <laughs> a you long time. She started when she was five. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you look way too young for that. I wasn't gonna say it since you said it. We're, we're good with that. No, it's fine. <laughs> yeah, I know, something to be very proud of, very proud of. So I know, Margaret, so many of the women in this audience have had success and satisfaction in many areas of life. But for many of the women who may be listening, the area of relationships has been challenging. And that's my own story. I had my own long and winding journey to love. And um, because of that, I'm so passionate about helping other people to move along that path and that journey. And that's why I love featuring experts like you that I believe can help. And so, so one of the things that we commonly hear from these women is that they just feel like they are not attracting the right person, the right people into their lives. Some people wonder if it means their picker is off or something is wrong with them, but it can be a real source of frustration. And so I would love to hear your thoughts on why we tend to attract the people that we do and what we can do to perhaps attract a higher level, higher quality or better match of person. So one of the things that's important uh, to understand is that we attract at our common level of what I call self-abandonment or our common level of self-love. And most people have no understanding of either of those. And so I'm, I'm going to talk about those because we, we attract it at, at our common frequency, the, the energy with which we vibrate. So um, when we're abandoning ourselves, there's, there's like four major ways that all of us have learned to do this when we're growing up. 
we learn to to basically not take emotional responsibility for ourselves because our parents or caregivers or other people did not role model emotional responsibility. These women might be taking financial responsibility, maybe physical responsibility, but emotional responsibility is not something that most people understand. Most people don't know that they need to take responsibility for their own feelings. In fact, I was talking with a therapist today who's an older woman. She says, I had no idea, even though she's been practicing therapy, that I was responsible for my own feelings. I thought somebody else was supposed to make me happy and make me feel complete and take care of my pain and all of that. So these four ways that we abandon ourselves, one of them is that we've all learned to stay up in our head because we had pain when we were growing up. And that pain is in our body. Our feelings are in our body. And so most of us had no idea how to handle that. And so we learned to disconnect, to dissociate from our body and go up in our head. Well, you know, if a child came to you upset and you're off on your computer or you're reading a book or you're watching TV and you're not attending, that child's going to feel rejected and abandoned. And we do that to ourselves when we stay up in our head. The second way is that we judge ourselves. And again, if a child came in and was upset and you said, oh, don't cry over spilt milk or, you know, you shouldn't feel that way. We do that to ourselves all the time. We judge ourselves. I shouldn't feel that way. What's wrong with me? I'm not good enough. I'm too weak. These feelings are weak. All kinds of judgments. We level at ourselves. Well, then we make ourselves feel anxious or depressed or guilty or shamed, um, un- unloved, unlovable. A third way is we numb with various addictions. You know, we graze in front of the refrigerator, we we take a drink, we smoke a cigarette, we watch TV, uh, we we go on the internet, on, on social media, we play video games, all sorts of things. We go shopping, spend money to avoid feeling whatever we're feeling. And of course, the more we abandon them, the more we abandon ourselves, the worse we feel. So then we're, we're going to more addictions to numb that out. And the fourth way, which occurs so often in relationships, is that we make other people responsible for whether or not we're okay. They have to love us. They have to approve of us. For, we're, for us to feel like we're okay, rather than learning to do that for ourselves. And once we make somebody else responsible, then we have to control them. And trying to control people is what causes relationships to fail. And so if you're abandoning yourself, you're going to attract somebody who's abandoning themselves because if they're loving themselves and you're not, they're not going to be attracted to you. And so then two people who are abandoning themselves come together, expecting the other person to make them feel loved. And they do that at the beginning. But after a while, we don't have love to share with somebody when we're abandoning ourselves, when we don't know how to love ourselves. We don't have love to share with another person. And so that relationship ends up not working well, when we're each expecting the other person to give us what we're not giving to ourselves. So the best way to start to attract somebody that you can have a loving relationship with and share love with is to actually learn to love yourself by learning to take responsibility for your own feelings. And this is what I teach in the inner bonding process and learning to connect with a higher source of love and wisdom and truth because we don't have role models in our society for what it looks like to love ourselves. We have to learn to turn to a higher source for that information. And that is part of what we teach in the inner bonding process. Wow, there's so much there. There's so much there. And that was so profound what you said there. Um, I want to, before I ask you a little bit more about the inner bonding process, Margaret, I want to kind of rewind just a little bit and ask you a couple of additional questions. Would that be all right? Sure, go right ahead. So when you talk about emotional abandonment, it seems to me, and this is just a hunch, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on this, that judging ourselves, numbing ourselves with addictions, making other people responsible Um, It seems like all of these are, first of all, interconnected. 
And I'm not sure if some people understand fully what emotional abandonment means. Does it mean, like you said, we've just disconnected with our emotions? We're not allowing them ourselves to feel them? Are we pushing them down, suppressing them? Tell us a little bit more about that, because this feels really important to understand on a deeper level. So let me explain that there's two kinds of emotions, what I call the existential feelings of life. And these are these are feelings of life. Like we lose somebody we love. We feel grief. We feel heartbreak. Uh, we feel helpless over it. We feel lonely. There's there's all these life experiences. Somebody is angry with you and rejects you. Of course, you're going to feel, you know, the heartbreak and the loneliness and the helplessness. So when we were little, we had a lot of these feelings and we couldn't manage them. So we never learned to lovingly manage those feelings. What we did learn to do is to suppress them, is to, like I said, go up in our head, turn to addictions, uh, judge ourselves, um, all sorts of ways we learn to avoid those feelings. Now, the problem is that all the ways we learn to avoid those feelings are now causing what we call the wounded feelings. So like when we're ignoring our feelings, when we're judging our feelings, when we're numbing our feelings, uh, when we're making others responsible for them, we're gonna feel rejected and abandoned inside, which means we might feel anxious or depressed or angry or guilty or shamed or, or empty or alone or jealous. These are the feelings that we often cause, there may be other causes for some of them, but we are often the cause of these feelings. And so taking responsibility for our feelings, taking emotional responsibility means that we learn to get present with our feelings with a desire to learn what they're telling us. Some people are aware of their feelings, some people aren't, but very few people open to their feelings on the level of the fact that these feelings have information. They may be informing you that you're um, that you're abandoning yourself. They may be informing you about something that's happening with another person or a situation, but all of them have information. And so taking emotional responsibility is about being open to learning from our feelings and wanting to understand what we're doing or what's happening that we need to take care of rather than do something to avoid them. Wow. Yeah. So powerful. So powerful. So you talked about this and then you talked about the importance of loving ourselves. And for, for a long time, we've heard this idea out there in the world, how important it is to love ourselves. And I think for many people, this doesn't feel terribly clear in terms of what that actually means. And then to take it an ep the next step, step further how we actually do that right because right. yes it sounds like a wonderful idea in in theory but making it real or conceptual or understanding how that really works i think is sort of vague for a lot of people yeah so i mean you know, most people know that um loving themselves on the physical level for example eating well getting enough exercise getting enough sleep they understand that on the physical level and some people think that that means they're loving themselves. Well, they are on the physical level or um, they learn to take financial responsibility. They earn enough money, they're careful with their money, they, they don't put themselves in debt. So they understand that on that level, they might be loving themselves. But most people have no idea about emotionally loving themselves. They, they've never been taught to be open to their feelings. They've never been taught to bring in love and compassion, which we don't manufacture, we open to. In my experience, that's what spirit is. It's love, compassion, peace, wisdom, joy. And we can open to that and invite that in to help us take care of our feelings. So again, using a child, like let's say you have a baby. If you wanna be a good parent, you don't put the baby to sleep and then go out to lunch. <laughs> you have a baby monitor on. And as soon as the baby cries, that's information. The cry is information. You're gonna go pick up the baby. And you're gonna think, what does this baby need? Does the baby need to be fed or rocked or changed? You're gonna be open to learning, even though the baby can't tell you, you're gonna be open to learning about what does this baby need? So 
I call emotional responsibility having your inner baby monitor on, which oh. means we're listening for anything inside other than peace and fullness. And as soon as we feel something other than peace and fullness, we're going to attend. And that's what the inner bonding process is about. It's a six step process for learning how to take that responsibility. Mm. Having your inner baby monitor on. I love that. I love that. So for example, if we're feeling an emotion like fear, yeah. we're feeling an emotion like sadness or loss or whatever the emotion might be, even perhaps joy, mm -hmm. we could say and understand, and I know you have a process for this, but, but the inner baby monitor would be asking, what is that? What is that? What is the message? What do I need? Or what is this telling me? I know I'm totally simplifying, but just yeah. to kind of get a little idea here. Yeah, well, for example, joy is letting us know that, in fact, we are taking care of ourselves. So Okay, good. That's great. But if we're feeling um, any sadness or we're feeling um, any of the wounded feelings, anxiety, guilt, shame, anger, uh, we're, we're feeling, uh, you know, heartbreak, uh, we're feeling helpless over others and situations. Yes, we have to attend to those if we're going to take emotional responsibility. So um, with the inner bonding process, what people learn to do in step one is to get present in their body because a lot of people, like I said, they, they've been in their head, they don't even know what they feel or they go and they just feel numb because they've been putting a lid on their feelings. And so step one is to be willing to just learn to get present inside our body, which may take people a lot of practice, took me a lot of practice. I was, I was a caretaker. I had been trained to take care of everybody else's feelings. I had no idea what I felt about anything when I started to practice inner bonding 35 years ago. So it took time for me to get from my head to my heart and soul to get in my body. So that I, I knew when that baby inside or that child inside was needing me. Otherwise, in my head, I didn't know. I didn't yeah. even know I was having a feeling. Yeah, and I think this is so common for so many women to be detached from those feelings because a lot of times when I'm talking to women about what they need or even what they want, they have a hard time accessing that because right. like you said, maybe they've had role models in terms of people pleasing or being so self-sacrificing that they've learned to just kind of ignore or subdued their own wants, needs, or feelings. And so I think this, what you're talking about is actually very common for a lot of women. And like you said, connecting into that body, it's almost like something that because we haven't done it for a long time or because we've been afraid to do it, it can feel like a very unfamiliar path until we, until we find tools for doing that, yeah. Yeah. And, and people get scared. They think, oh, my God, if I'm going to feel my feelings, I'm going to get overwhelmed. I won't be able to function. And of course, that that was true when we were little. But now we can learn how to manage these feelings and learn from them. And really, that's so empowering when we learn to do that. So step one, getting in your body. Step two, we move into our heart and we make a decision that we want to learn. In the inner body, there's only two intentions. One is to protect against our pain with controlling, with some form of controlling behavior. And the other is to open to learning about loving ourselves. And so when we open to learning about loving ourselves, the heart opens up. And we open a channel to being able to access higher information. It doesn't matter what people believe. They don't have to believe anything. That channel opens anyway. And so in step two, we're saying, okay, I'm open to learning and I invite love and compassion into my heart. So we're operating um, as what we call an inner body, the loving adult, where we're curious, we're open, we're compassionate, like we, want, like we would want to be with a child who is hurting. Mm -hmm. Step three is a dialogue process where we're going in, we're saying, like, let's say I'm feeling depressed uh, or anxious. And I would go in and say, uh, what am I telling you? How am I treating you? What am I doing or not doing that's causing this feeling? So uh, let's say I'm depressed. And, and if I go inside and let that depression talk, 
it might say, you, you, you just ignore me. You don't know I'm here. You just numb me out all the time. Uh, I mean, you, you just don't even know that I exist. You don't know that there's even a feeling going on. So, of course, I'm feeling depressed. I don't even exist for you. Or, or if I'm anxious, it might be saying, well, yeah, you're putting all this pressure on me. You're judging me. You're telling me I got to be perfect. I got to do everything right. I've got to have control over how other people feel about me. And if only I do it right and I'm perfect. That's a lot of pressure that people put on themselves with all that judgment. Yeah, that's going to make that's going to make us feel anxious. And so that's that's the kind of information that we might access when we go inside. Now, again, all this takes practice. It's not instant. And once we understand how we're treating ourselves, we go a little deeper and we say, why? You know, why am I putting this pressure on myself? What am I afraid of? Or what do I believe? Oh, I believe if I pressure myself, then I'll get myself to perform. Then I'll get myself to do things right. And then I'll get the love and approval that I need. And so there's so many false beliefs in there that we uncover when we do this process. Once we understand what we're doing and why we're doing it, then in step four, we go to our higher guidance. And that can be whatever it is, whatever a person believes, or even just the air if somebody doesn't believe anything. And we're asking two questions. What is the truth about any of the false beliefs that I'm operating from? And what would be loving to me? See, that's such an important question. And I ask that all day long. What's loving to me now? What's in my highest good now? Um, understanding that what's loving to me is also loving to everybody else. I'm not going to be doing something for me that's going to hurt other people. So um, when we love ourselves, we're also loving others. And, and so we ask, you know, what, what can I do right now? that's loving to me, what's, what's really in my highest good? And with practice, you learn to access that. Words may come, pictures might come, feelings might come. And then in step five, you do it. <laughs> you do the action. Like if a child came to you and said, I'm hungry, and you say, oh, thanks for sharing, but you don't give them food, it doesn't mean anything. And so we take whatever the loving action is, which might be just holding ourselves, might, might just be bringing in compassion, or it might be speaking up with somebody, or it might be changing jobs. I mean, it could be huge. Um, but we eventually take that loving action. And when we've taken a loving action, we're going to feel relief inside. And that's what lets us know that we've taken a loving action. If we don't feel relief, then we go back and see what else can I do? to take an action. And over time of practicing these steps, we actually change our brain. We, we retrain the brain. We, we create new neural pathways in the brain for loving ourselves rather than abandoning ourselves. Because the part of us that abandons ourselves is that ego wounded part of us that exists in the lower brain, in the amygdala. And it's trained, it's been trained, it's been programmed since childhood to be reactive to pain. Whereas when we practice this, we create those new neural pathways so that we're not on automatic. We're reacting completely differently to if fear comes up or we're threatened by something or somebody's upset or angry with us. We react completely differently to it. So that's very briefly the inner bonding process. Wow, so beautiful. That's a lot to take in. And a couple of things that really stood out for me there, it's many things, but a couple that I'll mention. Uh, one was this need for self-compassion. I think it's interesting to observe sometimes how we can have so much more compassion often for other people than we do for ourselves, right? I that's think right. hardest for us to give that compassion, show that compassion, forgiveness, whatever is needed there for ourselves, where in so many cases, it's easier to do that for other people. And another thing that really struck me, which I think is really key is truth. Because I think so many times, you know, one of the questions you said is, what is the truth? Right. And I think the truth really does set us free. Yeah. And yet so often in our lives, we're afraid of looking at the truth. We're afraid mm -hmm. of knowing what the truth is. So as an example, Margaret, oftentimes I'll talk to women who have been through really painful breakups or relationships that haven't gone well. 
And <clears throat> excuse me, and I'll often ask them, I'll say, I understand hindsight's 2020, but as you look back in retrospect now, were there any signals or signs or indications that things might go in this direction? And in almost every case, they'll say yes. In fact, one woman said there were more red flags than in the Chinese communist parade. That was her way of putting it, <laughs> which I thought was pretty funny. But what I've, un what I've come to understand in my own life and then in the life of others is sometimes in relationships, they get really messy because we don't really look at the truth about what's going on within us or in relationship to this other person we unwittingly participate in our own deception, so to speak. That's right. And That's then right. we find ourselves hurt and wounded and again, blaming this other person or blaming ourselves and having a hard time having compassion and forgiveness. So I'm just relating some of this back to relationships here. Yeah, and, and I've had the same experience, Michelle, of people when I say to them, well, did you have any indication early in the relationship that there was something not right? And they almost always did. But like you said, they didn't pay attention to it. They didn't trust themselves. And that's that's part of what people learn to do is trust. They didn't trust their their feelings. Their feelings are their, their intuition, their inner guidance. Our feelings are a profound form of inner guidance. This is the soul that's in our body. We Our soul is really big and part of it is in our body and part of it is all around. And that's our higher self. And so as people practice inner bonding, they learn to trust that intuition, that inner knowing. And boy, does that go a long way in not getting into a relationship that's not going to work out. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Because if we're not in tune with or listening to or trusting our inner wisdom, that inner guide that I believe is a divinely given gift that we have. Right. Then how can we, then how can we be, how can it benefit us? How can it bless us? And I, I do think that, as we talked about earlier, is a big challenge. I think uh, so many of us have become disconnected from that or at least have been at one point in our lives. So I want to kind of like move in a positive direction. And you've kind of talked about this already, but what does this make possible in terms of relationships when we go through this inner bonding process? What really becomes possible? I love to paint the vision of what's possible for people? Well, first of all, what becomes possible is that you start to attract a completely different kind of person. So for example, a young man came to me, I mean, we're talking mostly to, uh, you know, about women, but a young man came to me whose girlfriend had just broken up with him and he was devastated. Oh. And so uh, he started working with inner bonding and, and over time he started to attract a different kind of woman, then another different, and then, and, Eventually, he made a list of what he wanted, and he met a woman who was like 98% of everything on his list. They got married. They have two children. He got everything he wanted because he worked with himself to become loving to himself. So he was able to attract a really loving woman and they still correspond with me here and there you know they send me pictures of their kids which is great but that's what can happen when you learn to love yourself you start to attract a completely different kind of person and then when you get into a relationship instead of doing the codependent dance where you're making each other responsible by learning to love yourself you fill yourself up with love. It's a completely different feeling to come to somebody to share your love rather than to get love. Too many people get into relationships to get love, and that's what creates a problem. But when you're loving yourself, you don't need to go to that person to get love. You already have love in you. You've already learned to bring that love into your heart and soul, and then you wanna share it. Now, obviously, when two people have done that work and they're sharing their love, they have a fabulous relationship. They have fun, they have passion, they have learning, they have growth. All the wonderful things that we want comes from learning to love ourselves and being able to share love. Mm, so profound. Coming to share your love rather than coming to get love. So right. powerful. So powerful. And you can feel, you can just feel in that phrasing 
the difference between those two. Oh, yeah. Yeah, when we come to get love, we're coming empty, we're coming needy. We're, and then we have to try and control, like I said, to get that person to give us what we're not giving ourselves. And that creates all kinds of problems because then both people are doing that and, and that's a disaster. So when, we, when we're able to share love, wow, life, life is fantastic. I, to me, that's the highest experience in life is the sharing of love. I think that's the greatest thing in the world. And people think that getting a little bit of love or approval or attention is what makes them feel like, oh, I, I'm okay. It makes them feel good. That's actually an addiction. And it doesn't hold a candle to the sharing of love. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So beautiful. Well, this has just been amazing. I'm so grateful for what you've shared. And I know there are many people listening here, Margaret, that are going to want to go deeper and learn more about you and your work. And so if you would, I'd like first for you to tell us um, a little bit about the ebook that you have to offer. The link is below. Tell us a little bit about that first, and then we'll take it from there. Yeah. So um, this is an ebook, um, Four Secrets. Uh, um, (laughs) four secrets that block self-love and relationships. And this is a free book that everybody can um, get if they want to. It'll be very, very helpful for them in beginning to learn the inner bonding process. Okay. And the link for that for everybody. wait, 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 I'm confusing two things. Four mistakes that block self-love and relationships, four mistakes. That's the ebook. Okay. And then the webinar is three secrets to loving yourself and others. And so between the, the ebook and the webinar, people are going to get an amazing amount of information. Yeah, that's so beautiful and so generous. And for everyone watching or listening, the links for these, as I mentioned at the beginning, are right underneath this video or in the email that you um, got this from. And I would really encourage you to take advantage of this because it's a limited time. And of course, Margaret is going to be introducing you also to an opportunity to join her course, should you be attracted to this work and want to even go deeper and learn more. And I just think Margaret's work is just incredibly valuable for years from clients and from other colleagues, I've heard wonderful things about Margaret and her work. And you can get just a flavor of her today, which is why I wanted to interview her. But I think obviously there's so much here for those of us, myself included, who have struggled at times in our lives with relationships and with loving ourselves and um, want to create the possibility of that of having more love, deeper love, more satisfying love for ourselves and uh, potentially with a partner as well in our lives, I think this could be incredibly valuable. So I really encourage everyone to take advantage of these gifts and to participate in what Margaret is doing here to introduce you to her course. Is there anything else you'd like to say about all that, Margaret? You know, I just want to say that everybody can learn to do this. It's so life changing. It's been so life changing for me. Everything has changed in my life as a result of learning and her bonding, which actually came through from spirit. And um, and I just encourage people to to be willing to learn how to love themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think it's a gateway to so many things that are possible. I mean, you painted a beautiful picture of what's possible in relationships, but this has to impact all aspects of our life, life's quality and satisfaction. Right. Yeah. So Margaret, thank you once again. And again, everybody who's watching, make sure you check out the links below because you want to take advantage of this now um, because Margaret is going to be doing these webinars and offering this for just a short time. So we're so grateful, Margaret, for your wisdom and generosity and sharing. Well, and thank you so much. It's been it's been a delight, Michelle. Thank you. And we're so grateful to all of you who are watching and listening and hope this has been valuable for you. I know it has been for me. Thanks again. Bye-bye for now. Mm-hmm.